in Honoris these days, and uh, and this is really a pleasure to be able to to present the finances on uh, on the back of that. So first of all, when we look at what has happened for the, uh, during the past two years since we had the last Capital Markets Day, I'll just try and click again here. Um, so we had the last Capital Markets Day two years ago, and uh, when we look at the acceleration in top line, top line growth. Remember last year we delivered 36 percent top line growth. So so almost during two years we've doubled the top line of the company. Two years. We have quadrupled the cap expense over two years. And by the way, we're going to double it from this year to next year, or from 23 into, uh, into 24. And the R&D investments that you've heard from Marcus and Martin, the step up we're doing there is even faster than the acceleration in our top line. And that's on the P&L. Layer on top of that, the execution you heard from Dave in our business development efforts and acquiring external innovation into our pipeline. So, so really a period of unprecedented historic acceleration for no risk. And then you say, what does that matter? It's only no risk. And uh, these are only the absolute numbers. So, uh, so we also need to look at it in a relative perspective for a similar period of time. So when we compare to the industry, then the pace of our average sales growth during that period of time is more than double up compared to that of the industry. Our margin significantly higher than that of the industry, our operating profit margin. And do remember, we are reporting clean numbers, so there are no adjustments in, in our finances, as you recall. So we're not adjusting EBITDA and uh, core earnings and all that. This is uh, what you see is what you get. And talking about what you get, uh, cash return to shareholders. And uh, so one thing is to deliver operating profit growth, but of course it doesn't really matter unless you're able to convert that into cash flow, free cash flow, and return that to shareholders. And uh, that's what you see in the third bar. So, so really the cash return to shareholders also significantly higher than that of the industry. And then the last data point, and this is just a, a 2023 data point, return on investor capital, 89%, eight, nine. So that is when we do our benchmarking compared to that of the industry, number one, clear number one. So, so also very, very efficient capital utilization and return on invested capital. So that's history. So what are we going to do moving forward? This is really about how we allocate the resources we deploy in the company. And, uh, and the starting point there is simple. We start with the corporate strategy. You heard that from Lars. And, uh, and, and then we are super disciplined in investing in behind the corporate strategy in what drives profitable growth in the future. And we're investing on multiple time horizons. And that's what you see on the right hand side. This is really about driving the inline assets, the on market assets today, driving growth, diabetes, GLP-1. That's the first growth wave. The second growth wave really comes from obesity and then hopefully also from my mate uh, at a slightly later point in time, obesity is really taking off now. So investing in obesity, and, and then the third wave is uh, what you heard about uh, from uh, my R&D colleagues and from Camilla on, on cardiovascular and uh, emerging therapy areas, as well as our early pipeline. So, so really investing in that so we get into the third growth horizon. So really investing into growth on multiple uh, time horizons. So boiling that down to kind of the super, super simple version is invest in obesity care market developments, invest in expanding su supply chain, and invest in pipeline. I think my job is simple sometimes, but uh, uh, on a daily basis, it gets slightly more complicated. So, uh, so but double-clicking on, on, uh, on our resource allocation, so how, how do we allocate our commercial resources uh, in, into, into the company? I think Doc and Mike and Camilla really explained, and Ludo, around you know how we drive the uh, the assets we have in the market and our starting point is we have huge unmet needs 
big my commercial opportunities and highly competitive assets. And that's what we're investing against in our commercial investments. So we're stepping up our commercial investments mainly based on investing in obesity and the obesity opportunity. That is by far the biggest investment driver in terms of our resource allocation internally. On top of that, of course, we are mo gradually moving into cardiovascular disease. It's mainly in, in our research, pi research development pipeline right now, but of course we're preparing in terms of our commercial footprint, as Camilla was explaining. So it's, it's a gradual targeted approach, uh, which of course is being accelerated based on R&D pipeline readouts. And then on MASH, same principles uh, being uh, driven by pipeline readouts and of course a targeted approach utilizing our existing footprint and then going uh, focused on some of the specialist segments like hepatologists. And then lastly, on, uh, on Alzheimer's, as Mart Martin alluded to, no news today. So that's why we call it a, a targeted approach. Uh, now we're really awaiting the results from the EVOKE trial come next year. So when you put all that together, then yes, we're gonna invest more in, uh, in commercial investments because we have the opportunities in terms of driving growth, short and medium term. But at the same time, we do have the commercial infrastructure in place. So we don't need more GMs in, in the different markets. We're already present in 80 markets uh, today with, uh, with our own employees. We have the CRM systems in place etc etc so we have a lot of our commercial infrastructure in place and based on that then of course we are able to uh, increase our commercial investments at a lower pace than we increase our top line so we we get gearing or leverage on that front and hence and what we call an s d ratio coming down in the coming years for that reason then on the contrary in r d you heard about the opportunities we have in R&D, really about the unmet needs uh, in society within the therapeutic categories where we are operating. And as a consequence, we see those opportunities really justifying significant investments into pipeline. Because if we are able to solve these unmet needs, then the commercial opportunity is very, very significant. And hence the return in terms of R&D investments, very, very significant. So, so you should expect us to continue to increase our R&D investments over and above our top line growth and, and hence driving a significant step up in R&D investments. Again, it's, it's, it's devised through the corporate strategy, the priorities you saw earlier today. Uh, so, so really increasing investments in tier one, diabetes and obesity pipeline opportunities, tier two, uh, cardiovascular and rare bleeding dis disorders. When it comes to mass rare endocrine and chronic kidney disease, we believe at this point we are right-sized. It's selective targeted investments we're doing, uh, but with our current investments, we believe that that will not be the big moving piece uh, in, in the coming years in terms of the investment levels. And then for Alzheimer's, uh, I put in here that it's decreasing and, and it is decreasing for, for the simple reason that uh, with Evoke reading out next year, then of course, uh, then, uh, then R&D spending is, is, is going down for that si simple reason. We don't have a big portfolio of Alzheimer's uh, projects uh, for good reasons. But of course, with, uh, with that magnitude of step up in terms of R&D investments, then, uh, then we need to do that in a rational way. We need to ensure that uh, that we are comfortable that this will generate an attractive return on investment for our shareholders. Whereas uh, on commercial investments, it's simpler because it's more like a profit center mentality when, when you allocate on commercial investments. So in R&D investments, I t I've taken three pillars and it, it links very nicely to what you've seen before. So on research and early development, Marco showed it. it this is really about expanding our early pipeline for the third growth horizon I, I explained before. So expanding the early pipeline, you saw Marcus presenting an ambition about tripling the amount of first human doses. And of course, this is not only a numbers game about uh, quantity, it's really, really about quality. But it's just to say that, that, that we are very focused on expanding our early pipeline. Uh, you've seen it doubling almost over the last uh, years as Marcus presented. 
and with the ambition of tripling first tumor doses. So we do that, we allocate according to the priorities, and, and then of course we continue to focus on productivity, whether it's through AI or other means, as, as well as speed from a start of uh, research until uh, first tumor dose. In development, given the more mature nature of, uh, of the projects, then what we are looking at there, we have, a, a, I would say, a fairly straightforward uh, governance approach where we have a state gate uh, approach. So when a project enters phase two, then of course there's an evaluation about the opportunity behind a certain project. And with that also comes financial assessments. And the same when we go into phase three or phase three B, then there's a financial assessment coming together with the state gate passage. And as a consequence, we, we have the financial assessment around the viability of our late stage uh, projects. And then at the same time as in, uh, in research and early development, then, uh, then we have productivity metrics and speed metrics in, uh, in, uh, in development uh, with Martin and, uh, and the team that we monitor and benchmark on an industry level. And then for business development uh, that they've uh, covered and, and the step up there, we have a, a good governance model uh, where it, it comes to uh, approval, so we have search and evaluate, and then w when we see something that we might like, then uh, then it gets into a governance uh, setting where we assess is this something we want to pursue, and the assessment is basically linked to strategic fit. So does it fit into our therapeutic uh, strategies that you just saw earlier today? Scientific attractiveness: Do we believe that this is a competitive technology that we're pursuing? And then thirdly. Do we believe that, uh, that the price uh, required to close a deal, do we believe that that also generates value for Nuno shareholders? So that's, that's how we're governing our return on investment on, on our step up in terms of R&D investments. So that of course uh, yields a, a, a profit uh, for, uh, for the company and uh, that we're very focused on, on converting into free cash flow. And, uh, and the free cash flow, and in terms of our capital allocation of, of our cash flow generated, there we have a, a, a tiered approach also, our priority approach. So first of all, our preference is to invest in the company. And, uh, and of course, we only invest in the company if we believe that the investments we do generate an attractive return. Secondly, uh, after we've done that, we are focused on returning capital to shareholders through a consistent dividend approach of around 50% of net profit per year. Thirdly, beta investments into pipeline, uh, linked to what I explained before. And, and as the last point, we have a flexible share buyback approach. So our share buybacks you should see as the residual of when we've done the first three and, and then what is required in terms of financial reserve requirements on our balance sheet. So that may vary uh, between years. And then you see the development over time uh, on, on the right hand side of the slide. So uh, then a small bragging slide in, in terms of a capital return to shareholders. So, uh, so, so this covers the last two decades of capital return to shareholders. So, uh, so over the last roughly 20 years, we returned 500 billion DKK to shareholders. So, so I think a lot of people, they would have liked to own Novo shares at, uh, at, at that point in time and then sit on them. Uh, so but just to say a very consistent approach, around 50% uh, dividend uh, payout to, to, to net profit, and then the residual approach on, uh, on our share buyback uh, program. And, uh, and then the 23 number with the dividend is what is proposed for the upcoming ATM, which totals a uh, nine uh, kroner 40 euro uh, dividend per share, uh, which is a 52% increase compared to the preceding year. So a significant step up in, uh, in dividend per year uh, compared to uh, 2022. So that's the capital allocation to shareholders. And, uh, and then uh, net net, what does that drive in terms of, uh, of margins in, in the company when you put all this together? First of all, gross margin. So in the coming years, with 23 as a baseline, in the coming years, gross margin 
we expect will be flat, excluding uh, Catalans, which, uh, and I'll come back to that. So a flat gross margin over the coming years from a 23 baseline of around 84. The put some text behind why it's flat is we have favorable product mix, we have some negative price, and, uh, and, and then we have impact from the elevated level of CapEx that we're running right now. So some of our CapEx projects, that are for most of our CapEx projects, not all of the spending goes to the balance sheet, somewhat, somewhat it filters down into PL. So putting all that together, neutral, broadly neutral gross margin over the coming years. Then uh, in the light blue arrow, what you see is that assuming that the Catalan transaction closes later this year, then in the coming years, gross margin will go down. And the reason why it goes down is basically uh, linked to amortizations and depreciations linked to Catalan. So both on intangible and tangible assets, there will be a significant step up compared to before and uh, non-cash, and that is what is driving gross margin down. S&D cost ratio, I explained, uh, go, going down, R&D going up, admin continuing to go down simply due to the top line growth combined with, uh, with a platform already in place. Putting all that together yields a operating profit margin which is increasing but not as much as if we had not done the Catalan transaction, which of course we've done for very, very good reason, reasons in terms of scaling our supply base for the medium and long term. So that covers uh, the margin development. So in closing, accelerated sales growth, we're delivering top quartile sales growth in the industry. Uh, we have an operating profit margin above average in the industry. We have a growth and return focused resource allocation of the company linked to our corporate strategy. And then we continue to have a consistent financial discipline where we invest in the business while maintaining an attractive uh, capital allocation to our shareholders. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Lars back on stage. And I would like to invite, uh, I think, Doug and Mike uh, also to uh, a Q&A on financials. So, uh, yeah, let's start here. Closer. Yeah, please. I don't. I don't think the microphone is on. No. Try again. No. Uh, maybe now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Florence Espelès from Société Générale. A question on, on margin uh, going forward. Um, do you believe that uh, if at some point you cross the 50% threshold, even with Catalan, uh, wh what's the risk to see at some point? You, you talk a lot, uh, a lot about uh, access, uh, dr dr market access. It's important for, for the patients. But in the meantime, when you will uh, talk with payers, uh, we'll talk about budget as well. So if uh, Obesity has become really uh, meaningful, very significant market at some point. Uh, what about the conversation you could have with payers uh, given the strong improvement of your operating profit margin going forward? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And maybe I'll actually answer that. Um, so um, we are not uh, uh, having increased margin as a strategic objective, to be honest. Um, we see a, a dynamic dynamics right now where there's a very strong growth in our top line and uh, we are scaling as cast uh, alluded to um, but it's not an objective of ours to drive margin it's a dynamic uh, period right now where obesity is being acknowledged as a disease we're generating the data we hope will uh, create that uh, point um, at a po price point where payers are actually willing uh, to pay for it um, but it's also clear that we are scaling our volumes to get to many more patients. And typically, as you grow your business, you get to lower price points. Uh, and that could well be at a lower margin over time, but fueled by a bigger volume. 
So, so to succeed in serving many more patients, we'll also anticipate uh, lower price points uh, over time. But it's not meaningful to say go low on price now until the disease has been acknowledged. And in some of the conversations I've had with, with policymakers, uh, when they start talking about price, I say, okay, let's just align on the disease first and the value of treating patients. Because unless you see that as a meaningful activity, there's no price point that makes sense. So right now we have to establish that uh, body of evidence to have the right uh, discussion of what is the future price point. And I think that will unlock value, uh, volumes significantly. And that's what we're preparing for. So, so a strong business also at a lower price point in the future. And I think that will jive with the societal model that we want to, uh, to operate within. Hi, thank you, Emily Field from Barclays. Um, Doug, you talked about you know having navigated through multiple iterations of healthcare reform in the United States in the past. Generally, there's an expectation that semaglutide could be added to the Medicare drug price negotiation list for 27. It's obviously a very different product to some of the drugs being added in 26. Can you give us any initial thoughts on potential pricing impact there, or um, you know how you're thinking about that in the context of navigating through the IRA? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so Doug, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to predict about the future, but we are getting some experience right now in uh, negotiating with the government. We are, and I would never predict the future there, that's for sure, because <laughs> uh, it is uh, the government. But what I would say is this, you know, we're getting through negotiations right now with ASPART. We still have a couple rounds to go, so I really can't comment any further there. Um, but what I would say and what we've generally said is, is that one of the concerns we've had with the RA specifically is that it could limit innovation and choice for seniors downstream, and, and we think that is challenging. So I don't want to try to predict uh, what products and when and what that impact may be, so um, I'd characterize it as that. But maybe add that, of course, compared to the S-part negotiation we have now where there's limited volume opportunity, even at the lower price point in the U.S., there's still a significant volume opportunity. So again, uh, establishing the, the medical benefits of using semaglutide uh, will lead to, say, broader use uh, of the product. Uh, and I think that can somehow uh, compensate for also uh, government uh, negotiation. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll get a chance, both of you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Simon Baker from uh, Redburn Atlantic. Um, Doug, you mentioned um, your first appearance back in 2017. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and three of the things you highlighted as principles for success in the US market was uh, to integrate, localize, and focus. Um, I just wonder if you could update us on the localized bit. You, just, you said back then the market was very heterogeneous, and you gave some examples of, I think, actually Boston and, uh, and Birmingham, this very, very different uh, places where it needed a different approach. How's that changed over time? Is the US sort of coalescing into a more homogeneous system, or is it as varied as it used to be back in 2017? Thanks. It's good when... Uh, that was a good note, notes. I tell you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, good thing I read those slides and reviewed them with Dave before he got up here. But um, when we reorganized, we did change part of the commercial structure because we did, you know, the U.S. is made up of, of many, many, many different pieces, and still today. And I don't know if it's getting any more homogeneous. So for us, a little bit like Mike, when we think about market fit in the U.S., we are... Healthcare is local in the U.S., and we're trying to meet it where it is, whether it's the health system, the employer, the local payer. And our teams, we do get vertically, vertically integrated to make sure that we are bringing our best in terms of the dialogue and the communication that we're having in terms of the value of our brand. So I think we're still in that same model to a large degree, and I think it's still been successful. Thank you, Doug. Please. Hi, thanks. Steve Atkins from Poland Capital. I had a uh, follow-up for Karsten. Um, on the gross margin, uh, I understand with the increased amortization expenses from the Catalan deal, but you should be able to pull forward more revenues than expected, right? Because of the completion of the deal, that should be an offset. Are you uh, are you assuming that, or is it just because price will be a negative factor that gross margins still may decline? Yeah. So uh, so so clearly, the reason why we do Catalan this is to access more capacity faster. Uh, but uh, but the margin guidance uh, is for the coming years, so so it doesn't fully ups offset the step up in amortization. So if you look a little bit further out, then then you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks, uh, Matthias Hegblom, Handelsbanken. So, so growing at the pace you are as a corporation, you need to hire a lot more people compared to the pace you've done historically. So during 2023, I think the net number increased by some 17 percent. And I guess the gross number of people brought in was even higher. So, so how does you an, as an organization manage and, and does it provide new risks uh, given the current pace of hiring? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And we'll have uh, Tanya uh, Sabo, who is leading a people and organization on the stage later on. So maybe if we could park that question for her, uh, because I think she's, uh, she's the best uh, educated person for, for answering that. So we'll keep note of, of your question. Thank you. Pete. Uh, thanks, Peter Adult City. Um, Doug, I'm not going to let you get away with sort of the Medicare sort of brush off, but of course, uh, why would you do that? It is election year, I understand, and there's probably bigger fish to fry. But um, in light of the select data, in light of your competitors being a bit more vocal about, you know, it's not a matter of if but when. Is there anything you're hearing in terms of you know potential Medicare opening up or the appetite for that to, so that bill to hit hit the floor, or is it really? You know, what is your intel telling you? Thank you for the question, because it is, it is a, a very important issue for us to unlock access for seniors in our country for anti-obesity medications in total. And I think that, uh, I guess, how I would characterize it is my own team, my own public affairs team still has, it characterizes as, you know, if and not, or when and not if. And I think that for us, we still have more signatures. We got to get an appropriate CBO scoring. And I think that, as I continue to say, that the body of evidence that we're building and select importantly puts us in a better position, for sure. And of course, short term, we have plenty of patients to, uh, to target. So uh, we, can, we can be patient on that. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Seamus Fernandez at, at Guggenheim. Just a, a question on the CapEx side of things. Commitment to Cagri Sema, complex manufacturing pen. I think in our conversations, you've actually said, Karsten, that uh, you know, this market can only be supplied on the injectable side uh, up to a certain point, but that the flex pen and multi-dose pens are absolutely critical. Is that possible with Kegri Sema, or is Kegri Sema more of a bridge to the rest of the pipeline? Um, so Carsten, yeah, yeah. Ma maybe also perspective on how we see, say, lifestyle, like ma lifestyle management of Kegri Sema. Yeah, so, so, so first of all, uh, well, what we're looking at now and the scaling we're doing on, on SEMA alone, we're, we're getting a lot of experience uh, as, as Henrik was covering, covering between single dose devices, flex touch and, uh, and, and how to balance our portfolio in, in, in that respect. And yes, in phase three, Kegro SEMA is, is in the dual chamber single use device. And uh, if we can get that into a flex touch device, that would of course increase scalability of, uh, of, of Kegro SEMA. It's not a slam dunk, but, uh, but as Henrik showed uh, earlier on, uh, one of the aspects that, that we're looking at uh, actively right now is a co-formulation of, of Kegrosema. So it's not a dual chamber device, but a single chamber device. So, so we are working on, on uh, product development and, and hence scaling of, of, of Kegrosema. So you should not see Kegrosema as kind of a stepping stone to, to something coming later. Uh, but, but at the same time, I hope what we've shown today uh, is is the portfolio we are playing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pipeline we have in obesity, uh, where Kegrosema is, is one play, but we have a number of other plays vis-a-vis -vis efficacy and, and scalability. Yeah, thank you, Carsten. Is Martin here? Um, Martin Parker, SAP. Uh, just, uh, I know we haven't talked so much about Alzheimer's today, uh, but uh, given that you will see this Medicare price cut in 27, have you advertised for, for appetite for investing in Alzheimer's drug, which will be hit potentially by the same? And I guess there will be a lot of Medicare patients in particular for that uh, patient population. Yeah, I, th I think we can, we can perhaps say that, uh, yes, we have, uh, because we, we started it and I think we, we start down that track before the IRA uh, came about. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before, um, we are pursuing a, a volume strategy for semaglutide. And uh, I think the number of indications we can, we can expand into is actually part of also making that an attractive business despite uh, negotiating uh, pricing with the government in the US. So um, 
we need to see the data, um, but I think that's part of what also uh, makes it attractive despite uh, healthcare reforms. And and as you know, Medicare Part D is some 25, 30% of our US business. So it's not like we let one channel dictate, you know, how, how we, you know, optimize the rest of our business. Yeah, let's bring it back. Um, just uh, quick to repeat well for Jeffries. Um, wh what's the, the backup plan, I guess, if Catalan weren't to go through or if there were to be, you know, from the from the regulatory authorities, certain, you know, steps, I guess, required that, that you're not anticipating? And, and just to be clear as well, is the CapEx framework you've outlined, does that already include any additional CapEx that may be needed with Catalan, if you like? Or because I guess the, your financial outlook had pre and post, just to be clear, is, is, is that irrespective, really, to be honest, on the magnitude? with Catalan going through? So I can talk a bit to the strategy around uh, Catalan and, and the fallback, and then uh, Carsten, you could talk to, to the CapEx around that. So we can say uh, all along we had a plan to build capacity in-house. Uh, you have seen that we are building significant API capacity. We had a facility coming in line in the US. Uh, recently, we have two undergoing construction in Denmark, so really ramping up significant API and uh, many of you will have an opportunity of visiting uh, that site tomorrow. And then in parallel, we are building the fill finish to, uh, to say, utilize that API. And uh, there's a plan looking at leveraging our existing sites. And uh, then uh, Catalan, uh, being a challenged uh, company, uh, then provide an opportunity for us, together with uh, Nova Holdings, uh, acquiring uh, three sites. So it's really an acceleration of what we would be able to do in-house. And that is created by leveraging, say, uh, space they have uh, put in uh, filling suites that were already ordered. So it, it's accelerating that uh, strategy. So in that also lies that the plan B is that we will stick to the original plan and, and build that. Uh, and we have additional capacity coming in gradually over the coming years. And that will then just happen at a, at a lower pace. Uh, so we feel that's, uh, say, a robust uh, plan and, of course, attractive by accelerating it. Maybe, Carsten, you can talk a bit to, to the CapEx uh, yeah. profile. Yeah, so, so just reiterating, uh, so, so the base plan is that the, the Catalan transaction closes and, and we form that basis on numerous external legal opinions uh, that we did as, as part of uh, we and the, uh, and the other uh, pieces uh, in, in the transaction did as, as part of due diligence. So, so, so that is the base plan, um, and, uh, and which is hence also what is reflected in, in the CAPEX outlook that, uh, that, that Hen Henrik uh, explained. And, and of course, if, if, if we diverge fra from that, then, uh, then w it will entail more CAPEX uh, internally and, and probably also more CMO ag ag agreements uh, externally.